Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, recorded after episode 473 and after 474. You may see it before those two episodes because it's kind of late breaking news, but this is episode 475. It's late breaking. We're just going to throw it out there. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is January 10th, 2019. I'm going to say 11th. 11th. Still January 11th. <laughs> Yesterday <laughs> was January 10th. Today is January 11th. Okay, welcome to another show. Before you do anything, uh, this is, uh, episode is getting a lot of viewership, so we want you to like the episode. We want you to share the episode. We want you to subscribe to the episode. If you've never seen Unscripted before, by the time you get to the end of this, you're going to be addicted. You're going to say, I need to see every episode. So go to YouTube, our YouTube channel. It's right here in the show notes. Subscribe to it. There's a little red bar there. If you want to know right away when there's a new episode, click the little bell, and it will send you an instant message that, well, not an instant message, but an instant notification that there is a new episode like this late breaking episode up. So we did a show about two hours ago. I was editing it, and boom, I get... Uh, a late breaking notice that the Episcopal Church, uh, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, has responded to the response of the response of the response going all the way back to B12. Uh, if you guys remember, B12 at General Convention was the initiation of trial rights, making it mandatory, those are double quotes, for all the uh, dioceses in the Episcopal Church to conduct them without refusal. Um, and now we've got to the point where most of the bishops in the church said, okay, or they said, well, if it happens in my diocese, I'm just not going to deal with those churches. I'll get deeper going or I'll get something going. The remaining conservatives have done that. Then there's Bishop Love who said, uh, excuse me? No, we're not doing it in my diocese. It's not going to happen in Albany. And so he responded to, uh, the general convention, wrote a nice letter and we put it on Anglican Inc., there was an initial response to that letter from Michael Curry. Now there is a more definite final response. And what does that letter say, George? The response says that the presiding bishop issues a partial inhibition of the Ministry of Bill Love and that he allows the complaints that have been made against Bill Love to go forward for review by the intake officer for the House of Bishop, Todd Owsley. So some people will read this, Bishop Love to go on trial, he's been inhibited. And the answer is yes and no. This is not what you think it is. This is actually good news for Bill Love. Up to a point, I mean, good news for Bill Love would be the repentance of General Convention and the Episcopal Church returning to the norms of Christendom, not the worship of Baal. I'm just, I'm just going to say that. All right. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, and that's a valid point. In the, in the best of all worlds, none of this would happen. But let's operate in a world where evil exists, men are broken, and we have to deal with the evil that lays in front of us. Now, why, why do I say this is a good outcome? Bishop Love is now going to have legal expenses that he may, that he hasn't planned on having. Diocese of Albany can't pay these bills. That's not a good thing. Diocese of Albany is having its bishop publicly humiliated. That's not a good thing. Diocese of Albany is being split apart with uh, congregations have, who have been a thorn in the bishop's side for years now get to crow over the bishop. That's not a good thing. But how can I say this is a good thing? We need to put this in proper context. And now, let me ask you, Kevin, what would Catherine Jefford Shorey have done to Bill Love compared to what Michael Curry did? Well, you've heard of the Persian nuclear missiles. Persian uh, nuclear missile? <laughs> the peacemaker. Oh, uh, Pershing. Pershing. For sure. <laughs> Pershing. What did I, oh, my. Sorry. I'm, the I'm not finished ball. my coffee yet. Yes. The neutron um, ball. Uh, the, uh, Catherine Jefferson Shorey would have empl employed the peacekeeper. And it, it, the peacekeeper would have been uh, one of the most violent responses you could see as Bishop... Uh, Duncan asked Bishop Lawrence about uh, that type of response. Uh, this is a new time in a new administration. 
The problem is, Cap Jeffrey Shorey dealt with the crazies in the Episcopal Church as a crazy. Michael uh, Curry is dealing with the crazies as a liberal moderate. So let, let me explain where I'm going with this. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey would have removed from the ministry of the Episcopal Church Bill Love for abandoning the communion of the church. In other words, Bill Love took an official action just as Bob Duncan did, as John David Schofield did, as Jack Guy, so on and so on and so forth. And without benefit of trial, without benefit of following the rules, she just kicked them out of the church. What did Michael Curry do? Michael Curry issued a partial inhibition in that he said, you may not, my, you may, Bishop Love, you're still bishop. You're still the ecclesiastical authority of the Diocese of Albany. None of your powers are taken away from you. You remain in office as a bishop in good standing, except you may not charge any of your clergy if they should perform a gay marriage according to the General Convention rights. So here's why this is not such a bad thing. Love is left in place, and he's given the opportunity to mount a defense. I'll explain what the defenses are at Please later. Please do. <laughs> it, it gives him the opportunity to mount a defense. And second, Bill Love would not be bringing charges against clergy who perform gay marriages. The other clergy of Albany may still bring charges. It's just Bill Love may not bring the charges and Bill Love may not adjudicate their cases. Well, Bill Love doesn't it's, adjudicate yeah, their that, cases. Yeah. <laughs> so what does this say? If I am a member of the clergy of Albany and I believe that a, one of my fellow priests has violated diocesan guidelines and moral conduct for acting in, in this way, I still have the right to bring charges. Bill Love doesn't. So these people will still be brought on trial if there is the will to do that. Oh, my. That's, is that Curry? That's Curry, isn't it? Oh, that's Michael Curry. <laughs> so second... The penalty is a non-penalty. And then Bishop Love has already been presented for charges by lay and clergy members of the Diocese of Albany. That has already been out there. It's not Michael Curry doing this. And Michael Curry is basically saying, okay, they can go forward. And where Michael, and now Bill, Bob Duncan and company never had an opportunity to contest law, the charges against them. They, it was just a fait accompli. Now, Bill Love can raise the bigger picture is the changing of marriage doctrine within the ambit of general convention. That's an issue that politically has been lost, but legally has not been addressed. But then there's the issue, is a resolution binding or is a resolution advisory? If a resolution does not become a canon, when is it enforceable? Are all these resolutions passed about free mumia abul jamal binding upon the Episcopal Church. You know, the General Convention passes thousands of nonsensical resolutions that disappear the moment they're, they're done. It when are they B12. binding? When are they binding? When are they not binding? In other words, and when does a resolution of convention over, over uh, supersede a diocesan canon or resolution? These are all legal issues that are not settled. Now, I don't know if Bishop Love has the money or the willpower to fight these issues. But let, let me put this as, you know, given the environment in which Bill Love lives, this is a good outcome. It allows him to continue the good fight. It allows him to marshal his resources. It doesn't rob him of any authority that he would normally have exercised. It allows him to fight another day. And when in your, this environment and you're not dead, that's a good outcome. I do notice in, in reading through this that there are a lot of loopholes. It seems somebody's legal team did not go through this document. Uh, Bill Love has a lot on his side in this um, that he can just work around. And it's kind of like they're issuing a wrap on the fingers without a wrap. Yeah, and see, we need to understand that this is a battle of perceptions, a battle of PR. Now, there will be the people who are perpetually outraged on either side. They will start off their argument by saying, well, the Episcopal Church is going to hell. This is just expected. You know, let's get over it and, get, and you know, damn them to hell. 
Then other people say that Bill Love is a homophobe, he's awful, he's evil, we need to destroy him. There will be groups that will start out from this perspective. And then there's the real world. And the real world is where I operate, where you operate, Kevin, where most people operate, <laughs> where we live in a broken, fallen world. And sure. except on the internet and on Facebook and Twitter, we don't get our way and we can't get our opinions across. <laughs> Bill Love has the opportunity to prove his case um, um, among his peers. And his peers are the bishops of the Episcopal Church. His peers are through this tribunal system. Now, you can say it's incredibly corrupted, it's incredibly broken, it's a waste of time. Well, if that were the case, then you should fold your tent and go away and don't bother yourself with this issue. Or if you think that, you know, opportunities can occur that can be helpful even in the midst of da damning times, I think Bill Love should and can fight on. This will also I, strengthen the wobbling bishops, but, you know, like my bishop, uh, Greg Brewer. He's faced with uh, clergy insurrection uh, among mm -hmm. by one priest. We've laid out what you have to do. You have to have the vestry approval and the parish approval, meaning you have to have a full parish meeting where the bishop is there and you know go through all this. Well, they're not doing that. Now, does that mean that uh, Greg Brewer is just going to walk away and wash his hands of it and allow this to happen? Or is he going to say, okay, if we have to follow the rules, let's follow the rules. Well, if it, I good were, can come out of this if you look for yeah. it. If you assume evil, it, you're going to find evil and, you know, basically don't waste our time. The wisest tactic I could think of, and maybe the quickest, is that the next Dyson Convention uh, declare these churches that want to do this, uh, mission churches, where the bishop is the official clergy, and uh, that may be a, a way around it. I've, I've heard that's one of the ways, there's about three or four different loopholes you can try. Um, I'm sure they're all well aware of it up there. But we wanted to break you, bring in this late breaking news. Uh, it's the first time we've had a, a presiding bishop slash bishop news uh, of this caliber uh, since Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. But, you know, folks, if, if, if you want to understand the politics here, you need to see this as what it might, what it would have been under the past regime and how it's being played out in the current regime. Now, the presiding bishop is not uh, on side. He's not in favor of the things that uh, Kevin and I are in favor of. But at the same time, he is not Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. And we need to work with that and need to understand what opportunities and advantages we have and build from there. And if by chance Bishop Love wants to fill out an application for the ACNA, they're taking bishops. I don't see a problem there. Uh, but that's other news. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 475, a special edition of Anglican Unscripted.